Better and better and better and gainers, gainers. Better and better and better and gainers, gainers. The veteran gamers interview. Hello and welcome to the Veteran Gamers Interview. I'm Eric Piotrowski, a.k.a. Duke Scath, and I am honored to have as my guest today Mr. Jeff Vogel, the primary creative powerhouse behind Spiderweb Software. Uh, Mr. Vogel, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Vogel's been developing turn-based role-playing games for over 15 years now. In 1995, Spiderweb released Exile, which was praised for its story and its writing and gameplay in the best tradition of classic games like Ultima and the Dungeons & Dragons Gold Box series. Since then, the company has released more than a dozen similar games, and their success has allowed him to create video games as his full-time job. I have to say here, Mr. Vogel, in the interest of full disclosure, that I've been a huge fan of the Spiderweb titles ever since I played the very first Exile game as a college student when it first came out, so I'd like to thank you for the many hours of superb games that you've given me. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So, yeah, the Spiderweb software team consists of three people. Uh, there's you, your wife, Marianne, and your friend, Linda. And according to the website, you, you say that your wife, Marianne, handles everything at Spiderweb that you don't. Uh, so you're literally a mom-and-pop game company, which is not typically what a lot of us think about when we think of game studios. Uh, what would you say are the special benefits and or challenges to making games in this way? Well, it is literally, literally a mom-and-pop organization, with me being the pop. And um, it's a small company. I mean, it's very, you know, it's in a very informal home-based business. I, I think it's a personal thing. You know, it suits me personally to, to keep it small. Mm -hmm. When um, we released a game in 1997 called Exile 3 Ruined World, which was a huge success and, yeah. and did well enough that it was time to maybe consider looking for investors mm -hmm. and, and making it into a bigger company after a lot of thought and discussion. We just, we still... We intended to keep it small. We have a niche. Um, we en it's a niche we enjoy, and a niche we enjoy serving. Mm. And um, and so we just decided to stick with being small and making a decent living and enjoying life. That's great. And you know, you fill the niche really well, if you don't mind my saying so. And well, thank uh, you. yeah, you've described your workspace as a spider-infested basement. And is that in fact where the company name comes from, or is there some other story behind Spiderweb Software? Um. Well. In 1994, I started my first game. When I was getting done, I realized, oh, my God, I need to name the company. <laughs> um, and uh, at that point, I wasn't the, the place where I lived was infested with cockroaches, not uh -huh. spiders. Not but as good a like, game title, I suppose. Probably, although, although I do describe us as borrowing someone else's phrase as having the tenacity of the cockroach. Nice. We, we aren't actually fond of cockroaches. <laughs> and I've just always liked spiders. So uh -huh. I just, just picked it off at the top of my head. Having no idea, of course, that I would still be dealing with it 15, 16 years on. Right, right. So just real quick, if you could take us through the concepts behind the different game series. There's five in all, if I'm not mistaken. There's Exile, Avernum, Nethergate, Gene Forge, and now Abaddon. So could you say Correct. a little bit about the ideas behind them? Sure. Um, the, our very first one is Exile, which was later on rewritten from the ground up as Avernum. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is, it's about, uh, Avernum is this huge underground prison. The surface is ruled by the Empire, and that's all that it's known by, because why bother to come up with a name? It's the <laughs> only it's the only power. And the way they get rid of their, their sort of misfits and malcontents is they send them through a one-way portal into the underworld where they're forced to struggle to survive. And the, the um, Avernum series, it's our longest series, it's six games plus sort of a standalone game with, a, with the user, ability of the user to make, make their his or her own scenarios. Yeah. It's, um, it's a six-part series that's just sort of the story of Avernum, how they started out as this pathetic ragtag group of misfits and how little by little they sort of earned their freedom and fought their way back up to the surface. Let's see, there's Nethergate, which is a standalone game, which, which we rewrote from the ground up as Nethergate Resurrection, which is um, it's historical fantasy that takes place in Roman-occupied Britain, mm. sort of the battle between the Celts, the, the local barbarians, and the Romans, but with magic and fairies and, and mysticism thrown in. Right. Let's see, there's the Gene Forge series, which is sort of fantasy with a science fiction twist, mm -hmm. where all of, m most of the magic in this world has to do with creating creatures to serve as tools or servants or food uh, and that story is about the rebellion of the the rebellion of the creatures that were created who decided that they wanted their freedom after all 
And finally, our newest game, which is Avidon, which has just came out for the Mac and will be coming out for the Windows and the iPad shortly. In fact, the iPad version just entered into beta testing about 15 minutes ago. Oh, excellent. And that should be the first chapter of a trilogy. And that is the story of the Pact and the Far Lands and the Fortress of Avidon. The known lands in Avidon are, are split up into two, sort of two factions. The Pact, which is five countries that have banded together for strength to protect themselves from the barbarians and general crazy people of the Far Lands. The Far Lands are barbarians, monsters, lands occupied by failed empires. And the Pact is trying to defend itself from invasion. And the, the Pact's main tool for protecting itself is the Fortress of Avidon, which is this sort of power unto itself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't obey laws. It makes laws, and it is allowed to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, to make enemies of the Pact disappear. And you play in the game a servant of Avidon, the a hand of Avidon, one of the warriors who, you know, there's no rules. You just are mm -hmm. sent out to find people who would threaten the Pact and make them go away. Mm -hmm. And it's about what happens when the Avedon runs into a conspiracy that may, in fact, be too difficult for it to handle. Right. Those are the four series, the five right. series that we've worked on. Right. And you mentioned in a recent interview that you want almost all the moral choices in Avedon to be pretty gray. And it seems to me that this sort of thing is becoming increasingly common in RPGs, and I'm thinking especially here of Bioware. But it would have been insane to have this sort of thing in, like, the Bard's Tale or the D&D Gold Box series back in the day. Why do you think that moral gray area is becoming so popular now? Probably just m memory, probably just room to have the um, an involved story with enough details, enough size to have gray areas. It has to have a lot of dialogue or a lot of cut scenes or a lot, you know, a lot of personality, a lot of description, you know, a lot of stuff. And the Gold Fox games, which I love, I don't think there was just room on the disc for that much story. And partly also, I think it's just it's just a maturing of the medium that. You know, there's room for stories about, you know, bad guys, about the bad dragon that shows up and you have to hit it with a sword or whatever. Right. But these things evolve. And not everyone wants that sort of game. Not everyone wants something with shades of grades. And sometimes more beta testers will run and say, oh, good Lord, Jeff, just one game. Let me be the good guy and beat up monsters. <laughs> And that's kind of what the Avernum games are for. For the most part, the Avernum games are pretty cut and dried black and white. Just trying to get um, out of the jailhouse area. Yep. And uh, we're going to be rewriting the Avernum games from the ground up again. Wow. And those are less, more ambiguous, more fun, more mm -hmm. run out and fight and have a have a get treasure and have a good time games. And then the other series that I make are more the ambiguous, gray, heavy story games. Sure. And, you know, it seems to me like there's, there's obviously a big, heavy emphasis on making games that are very flashy and you know amazing graphics that you have to update your PC every 20 minutes in order to keep up with. But it seems to me that in some ways, the more certain game developers focus on those elements, the less time they're putting into quality story and you know riveting characters and dialogue and things. And it's always seemed to me that Spiderweb's games have really put a high premium on making sure the story is good and that the dialogue is realistic and that uh, there's a lot of those engaging story elements that uh, yeah that are really important for maintaining our interests. So. Well, we have to play to our strengths. Right. I mean, they're low-budget games by the standards of the industry. Right. Really not very good graphics. I mean, some people like them, Lord knows, mm -hmm. but I would be the first to admit that story is all we have. Right. All we have is, you know, the quality of the writing and the quality of the game system. Mm -hmm. So we have to focus on that because we simply don't have the budget to, to, to compete in any of the other arenas. Sure. And at the same time, I'd say that, you know, you're with Avedon, it looks like you keep finding ways to do excellent things with the way the game is played. I was very impressed with the fluidity of the movement, for instance, and the, the magic effects look really cool. So I think you're doing a lot of good work with the tools that you have access to. You can do a lot with particles. Yeah. If, if you want to make something look nice on the cheap, particles are the way to go. Just right. you know, throw up a lot of pretty little sparks on the screen, and 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 people will be okay with that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of advice for other developers, you did a series for the IGN RPG Vault, which I found very interesting. And you said to other developers that when your game is done, it will be a lonely, misbegotten thing, lumpy and misshapen, a foul parody of your original goal. Yeah, am I correct in assuming that this is spoken from your experience? I, I think that w w that is, I mean, that is my experience. But I think that's sort of a universal art thing. I think you'll very rarely hear successful uh, artists 
point as a thing they created and say, yeah, that's awesome. I was totally on top of that. I am, I am completely happy with, with how that turns out. It has not been my experience that people who have created something worthwhile feel that way about it. I think one of the things that drives one to be successful in artistic endeavors, and yes, I'm being pretentious and describing what I do as an artistic endeavor. Oh, go for it. Why not? Is that you're never happy with it. You always know the compromises you made. You always know the corners you had to cut just to just to get it done. Even if no one else ever finds I out did. about those corners or whatever? Yeah. Uh, usually they can. Sometimes they can't. And either way, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't hide anything from yourself. Right. And so if someone creates something and is pointing at it and saying, yeah, that's perfect. There's nothing I can I could do better about that. The odds are that probably isn't a very good artist. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, the drive to succeed the drive to improve is what makes you good at something. Now, on the flip side of that, after the game is done, then you have, of course, the marketing element of it. And you once described game marketing as an equally big and far more irritating job once the game is done. I'm actually interested to know about how the release and distribution part of the cycle has changed since Exile 1. Obviously, it's a very different world we're living in now compared to 1995. Everything is different. Everything has changed. I mean, I mean, in 1995, the World Wide Web existed, but only in, in this sort of tiny experimental form. Back in 1995, press magazines were relevant. Mm. People actually cared about print magazines. Now all of them have gone out of business except for, except for a tiny beleaguered handful. But well, okay, when I started, the big online force was, was AOL. Right. I, mean, I made my living off of shareware downloads on AOL. Mm -hmm. And now AOL is, you know, it's a joke. It's a footnote. People don't even get the jokes about AOL CDs being everywhere anymore. Right. And now instead, this website is blogs, it's Twitter and Facebook. Facebook is hugely important. And, you know, we're always blind on everything. It took us far longer to get a Facebook presence than it should have. But now, you know, the Spiderweb software on it on Facebook has gotten a de is decently sized and reasonably active. I probably will never do Twitter, but I should. I guess what I'm trying to say, the outlets to let people know about the game are very different instead of these sort of big centralized monolithic press outlets there's a million little blogs such as for example yours mm -hmm, right i mean you know I, I hope you aren't insulted by saying oh, not you're not really a blog and yeah. you're not really little but no we are you, you're not as big as say computer gaming world back of in course. the day right but on the other that, that creates a lot more outlets for a small company with a quality product that's willing to get out there and push it mm. there's a lot more outlets for a break right. than there was in my day and I really I really honestly believe it's better for an indie now than it was back in back in the shareware days when you had to get your games on BBSs right. BBSs for God's sake I seem to recall getting actual 3.5 inch discs from you but maybe I'm confusing that with a different game or something no that was us that was, that was us oh, classic when people ordered our game and they didn't you know they didn't have the demo is yeah. uh we put it on a floppy sure pass it around to other people at the uh, user group or whatever when no, i ahead. started there were shareware stores yeah, yeah you'd go to the mall and there was a store and you'd go in and the walls would be covered with floppy discs yeah. with shareware demos on them and of course none of the people who went to those stores knew anything about shareware they thought they were buying full full programs uh -huh. imagine their delight when they paid ten dollars <laughs> for a Three and a half inch disc got home and realized that someone else was going to have their hand out for twenty five more dollars. Right. That was a stupid system. I'm glad that's gone. <laughs> now, would you say that you said that it's a better system now? Obviously, but there must be a sort of double edged sword part to it because now more developers feel like they can put something out into the ether, even if they haven't put as much polish on it, and even if they haven't spent as much time with it. And it's a, it might be a little harder for the gamer to be able to tell easily which games are worth their time and which ones are not, because the, the signal-to-noise ratio might be a little lower. No, it's, it's all better now. I mean, you, you didn't think there was crap in 94? Come on. <laughs> okay, that's a fair point, yeah. When I first got my Macintosh in 94 before I wrote games, I bought, like, a couple of shower compilations, and I was so thrilled. And I, was, I played some stuff, and I was like, this is garbage. <laughs> this is all garbage. That was, as much as anything else, the thing that pushed me to write mm -hmm. my first game. I mean, if I would have loaded up the shareware CD and a really good fantasy RPG was on it, I probably would not have written my first game. I would have been busy playing that game. Yeah. I mean, shareware has 
horrible reputation in 94-95. That's true. The, I mean, indie games now have a, have a shaky reputation, but it's nothing compared to what people thought of shareware back mm-hmm. in the day. Yeah. It's sort of like what Stephen King said about how when he read a lot of bad writing growing up, it sort of, like you say, sort of inspired him. Hey, I can do better than this. You have continued to make turn-based RPGs. And meanwhile, the RPG genre as a whole is sort of moving toward action combat. Is there a particular reason? Is it just about like, resources or programming, or is there some other reason as well? There's a space in the world for turn-based games. I, I mean, I like them better. Okay, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that back. I actually you know, never play turn-based games myself, so I probably can't say... I like them. It's what I do. Mm-hmm. I really enjoy slow, tactical, mm. chess-like, stare at the board right. and figure out what to do sorts of games. Sure. I don't necessarily play role games, although I recently played a lot of fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons. Mm. I enjoyed that a fair amount. Yeah. I just I, I like I like the tactical thing. I like the the moving around the pieces and thinking it. And, and thinking things through. And there, there's there's room for that. There's lots of people who love turn-based games, and those people are underserved. Yeah. So that's a perfect opportunity for an indie developer. Absolutely. There's still huge room for in, for turn-based games all over the place. People love turn-based games. Mm-hmm. How many millions of copies has Civilization sold over Absolutely. the year? And it's something that I really love too. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel, you know, I, I do like Dragon Age. I like Oblivion. There's, there's, there's a place for those games, obviously. But I also do like being able to not feel like I constantly have to be aware of every single thing going on at all times, and I can just take a breath and figure out, okay, yeah, like you said, the tactical thing, what's going on on the board. Plus, the, there's a huge portion of gamers who don't like anything real time. Right. People who are older, people who are less, you know, hardcore gamery, mm-hmm. people who don't have good reflexes, who it just stresses them out. There are a lot of people who will only play a turn-based game, and and those people are a large part of my audience. Mm-hmm. And now you've said that Avedon has very little healing by design. The characters tend to heal up pretty quickly right after battle, and compared to other RPGs, we aren't chugging down the healing potions like teenagers gulping down Mountain Dew. Uh, is there a specific reason for that? I kind of liked it. I played, I played Dragon Age. Dragon Age worked that way. I thought it was pretty fun. I decided I'd do that. Yeah. There's no right and wrong answer for a lot of these things. A lot of times I will change things up when I write a new series because, to, to use the pretentious game designer um, phrasing, it opens up new design space. Mm. I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years, so mm. I, I have to change things frequently in order to um, just keep coming up with new ideas. I, I changed Avedon so that you always go into every battle basically fresh as a daisy. Mm-hmm. And that changes the sort of battles I have to design. It changes what I can do and how the battles work. In my Avernum and Geneforge games, you leave town and little by little your energy sort of flows away and you have to get back to town before you run out of your spell energy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's an old system for Final Fantasy. Lots of games right. have done like that where you have to re- return to town to rest. Mm-hmm. That changes how you design all the encounters. Mm-hmm. You have to, in that case, make the encounters smaller right. and lighter and it, you have to right lay out the dungeons in an entirely different way to have lots and lots of small fights to whittle away at the user's strength. Mm. If you change it so that you're you're at full strength every fight, it completely changes what you can do with the fights. You can have the dungeon be a smaller number of bigger, more challenging set piece battles. And so it changes dramatically the design process. Ideas that I couldn't do before, I can do now. Ideas I could do before, I can't do anymore, but that's good because I'm sick of those ideas. So I change things a lot from game to game, and people complain about it because people, by and large, don't like change. But I, what people need to understand is I have to do that just to keep having new ideas and keep from burning out. And speaking of change, you know, you mentioned Nethergate before, and you said that, these are your words here, you got pwned because sales weren't very good. So I'm just wondering, I mean, it seems like the swords and dragons thing, that standard medieval-esque setting, is so enrapturing for fantasy gamers and readers. And and why do you think that is? Well, I so I have overstated in the past, perhaps, how well Nevergate did overall. It would, did not have do quite as well as it would have done if I would have designed a standard fantasy game. But it did all right. We can't complain. The problem, with I think, with writing historical fantasy about the battle between the Romans and the Celts is that it's really hard to sell something like that without making it sound like an educational game. Right. And educational games are just, it's just the kiss of death. Right. You know, there's the stink of learning around it. I, I think that Minecraft is a very educational game, but they, they will never, if they're smart, try to sell it as such, because right. nobody wants educational games. Oh, my God. There's a Simpsons episode so, about that, I think, where Bart was playing an educational game, and he realized it was educational, and he immediately threw the controller down. And 
and well he should. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, back to the standard swords and sorcery thing. It's what people are comfortable with, and you, you step away from it at your peril. I, I don't think it's necessary to have, do that to be a success. I mean, look at Fallout. I do think that there's room, a lot of room for fantasy role-playing games in non-fantasy settings. But there's something about the fantasy thing that works so well, and it's so versatile, right. that I don't necessarily see the reason to not do fantasy games. People say, oh, you should write a science fiction game. Like, all of a sudden, that's going to necessarily immediately change the nature of the thing. But when someone says, I should write a science fiction game, why? What will change? What will be better? What is to be gained from arbitrarily switching the genre? I've been writing games, and there's a huge variety of uh, of the games I've written in terms of story. Mm -hmm. I think I've written some really beautiful, emotionally moving stories in the fantasy genre, and I don't. I don't see why to change that, change the fantasy part just for the sake of changing it. People say they want games in different genres, but I think at the end of the day, when they when they go to the store and they spend their money, I don't think they really care about the genre. I think mm-hmm. they care if the game's any good. Now, Avedon's going to be released soon for the iPad, as you mentioned. What do you expect in terms of player response, and are you worried about the, the sort of the flood of the different games in that market standing out in the iPad store? Oh, it probably won't do very well. But it's about the most cutthroat, bloodthirsty, nightmare market imaginable. Yeah. I have a fan base. A lot of them have said, we're going to buy this game for sure. And then, you know, a tiny portion of them actually will. Uh-huh. It'll probably make some money. Yeah. I think it'll be okay. Some of the stuff I do in, in, in my business is just for, it's just like a sabbatical. You know, it's just for personal interest and keep myself engaged and learning new skills and trying new things. When The first time I picked up the iPad in the Apple Store, I would hold it and held it in my hand and think to myself, like, this feels like I'm holding the future. I got to write a game for this. It's really cool. Is it going to sell? I, you know, I think it's pretty fun. I think I think the port is really solid. I think people are really going to enjoy it. Was it is a very it difficult process up? to port it over? It required a fair amount of thought and consideration because going from a monitor, going from a keyboard and a mouse to a touch screen for a hardcore game, that took a lot of thought. If you look at the role playing games available for the iPad and the iPhone, I don't say bad things about other indie developers, but I will say that there is still some room for improvement and thought and figuring out how to make these games, how to make hardcore or RPGs work on a touch screen. Yeah. It's an unanswered question, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm hoping that I've come up with a couple couple more answers. What's your favorite part about making video games? Stopping. <laughs> Being paid is nice. <laughs> It's my job. I've been doing it for, for, for 15 years. The thrill is gone. i got two kids that need to eat. Right. Uh, so what's the most frustrating thing about the process? Doing it. Mm. Has it become okay, a grind I, in any way? Oh, God, yes. Are <laughs> you kidding me? But, I mean, I, you know, after, after, after 15 years, you know, there's a few lucky people who still love their, love their jobs. But right. it's, it, it's – okay, the biggest grind is writing dialogue. Mm. Writing dialogue is, is just is just work. You know, for Avedon, Avedon has a ridiculous amount of dialogue, and, and I was having to ice my hands near the end of that. Mm. It's really painstaking, fiddly work, and there's a lot of it, and it needs to get done. I do it, and I don't expect anyone to feel sorry for me. You know, I'm doing what I said I wanted to do for a living as a kid. Mm. I make good money. Mm-hmm. I get to see my kids. I get to work at home. Mm. So no one should waste their pity on me. Mm. Still, 16 years is a long time. And, uh, you know, it's a job. I do my job. What has surprised you most about a previous game? Avernum 4 and Avernum 5 sold a lot better than I thought they would. Mm. That was a big relief. Were you able to figure out why? Money was getting a little tight for the business then. People really like Avernum, and people really like what I did with those engines. It's very, Avernum 4 through 6 was very different from Avernum 1 through 4, and the hardcore old-timey fans really didn't like the change for us for the most part. And they went on the forums and just complained and complained and complained. And if I only listened to the forums, you know, I would have been in the slough of despond. I would have been, how could I have done so terrible? And yet people bought those games. They bought them like crazy. Actually, I, you know, I'm honest. I, I just went to the forums and went like, guys, you know, I'm sorry you don't like the game. I, I got to change things up sometimes. People love this game. I don't know what to tell you. And that's basically how that went down. Avedon is also selling really well. And I, I admit to being slightly surprised at that because, you know, it's a new game. It's a very plot-heavy series. It's a new series. It doesn't have a recognized name. And yet it seems to be catching on. And the, the thing is, you know, I never know why people like them. It, because the vast, vast majority of people who buy my games, you know, I don't know anything about them. All I know them is a name and a credit card number. And they send those to me, and I give them a, a registration key. They disappear off into the wild, and I never, 
I never hear for a word from them again. When they don't like a game, I don't know why. When they like a game, I don't know why. All I know about is the opinions of the people who are always on our forums, and they're good people, and I love loyal fans, but they're only a tiny portion of the audience. Mm. I will never know why people like Avedon. All I can tell is that they appear to really like it. Any, any sort of market research? You do interviews or surveys or anything like that? Oh, we're, we're three people in a basement. We don't we don't we don't do the sort of things <laughs> you don't that have real a PR people department going out do. there and doing the. <laughs> I'm the PR department, and I suck at it. <laughs> Not at all. This is a great interview. Don't don't put yourself down like that. We release a game, and then either money comes in or it doesn't. <laughs> right. Who's your favorite character you've ever created, and why? I suppose I've uh, written enough games that that is a fair question. You know, and I'm sure that some, I'll slap my forehead and something will come to me. Of course. The, um, there's a character in Avedon named Natalie, who is, she's one of the characters who works for you. Mm -hmm. And she, basically, she's a 16-year-old magical prodigy who just wants nothing more. She, you know, she's got all of these powers, and, she's, and they're really strong, and she's just foolhardy and bloodthirsty, and she just wants to go out and blow. It, you know, she's like a teenager with a hot new car. She just mm -hmm. wants to go out and blow stuff up. Yeah, she's, and she's in Avedon. She's like the, the third character you meet in the game. And writing her dialogue was just a blast. And I think she's the fa of, of the characters who can join you. She's she's just the general favorite. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to developing games, you're also an author. Can you talk a little bit about your book, The Pooh Bomb, True Tales of Parental Terror? Why did you write yeah, it? Um, well, I wrote the book. My, my oldest daughter is nine now, and I wrote it. It was basically a weekly journal that I wrote the first year of her life, and I wrote it and I put it online. It was just mainly my humorous observations about parenting, and it was like a blog, like a blog before really there was much in the way of blogs. Mm -hmm. But it really caught on, and it got quite a following. It's still online at ironycentral.com, so anyone can read it can, and want to read, you know, funny things about babies from a really sort of cynical, embittered perspective can still look at all of that. And I, I wrote it just because, you know, sometimes sometimes you just there's stuff you write you just have to write. You have to get it out of your head or you're going to go crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote all of that because we literally, we got home from the hospital. We put the mother to bed. We put the baby to bed. I went downstairs and started writing because, mm -hmm. you know, it just sometimes it just has to come out. And it turned out to be really funny, and it became a book. It didn't sell very well. It's a crowded market, and I think that what I wrote was just a little bit too bitter and too cynical for what most parents want to write. But, you know, it has a small – the story about the baby and the story about the toddler, because I wrote it until our, my daughter was four, you know, still have followings. Mm -hmm. And I still get fan mail about it, and people still find their way to it. One Amazon review I read expressed a little concern about your daughter's privacy. Has that been a concern at all? How does she feel about the book? Some people – are insane. I don't. I, I, I read that review because, of course, I read my reviews. <laughs> yeah, you know, there was no privacy violation. If you read the book, which I'm not sure that person actually did, <laughs> most of it is about me right. and my opinions about parenting. The actual facts that were given about Cord about my daughter Cordelia um, are are just straight up generic baby fact. Mm -hmm. She wakes in the middle of the night. She cries. She has a diaper. She right. poops. She starts eating solid food. There's no secret. Right. There, I have not revealed any horrible secrets about her. And what horrible secrets can a two-year-old have, really? <laughs> I stopped writing it when she was four because it was getting to the point where, you know, she was becoming a person. Mm -hmm. And I thought privacy might start becoming an issue. But a newborn, come on. You have to wipe. <laughs> they, they expect you to wipe their butts for them. They have no secrecy. Right. There is no privacy for a newborn. <laughs> And does she like the book? Has she read it? She is aware that it exists. I think she is tickled that it exists. Mm -hmm. She has not actually read it. She, she might be still a little bit too young, and it has enough obscenity in it <laughs> that I probably would not let her read it right. from cover to cover until she was... She was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, she was a teenager, so she'll pretend to be all offended and, you right. know, Dad, how could you do this to me, blah, blah, blah. But you know, the money went to her college fund, so okay. so she can lump it. Exactly. Well, uh, I have no other questions. Anything else you wanted to add or any shout-outs you'd like to give to anybody? Just, a, you know, just a shameless self-promotion. It's at www.spiderwebsoftware.com. we got a bunch of retro indie role-playing games. There's a big free demo for each one, and we got a one-year money-back guarantee. You know, try something out. Avidon the Black Fortress is out for the Macintosh. It'll be out for Windows next month and for the iPad within a month or two after that. And once again, you know, it's a big demo, and uh, it's actually it's a, it's a good game. Try it out. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, Mr. Vogel. It's been a great talking to you. And, again, thank you for all the fantastic games. And thank you very much. This conversation, this conversation is over. Is over.